and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's program is landscape astrophotography. And here to tell us all about it is our guest, Adrian Bradley of the Warren Astronomical Society. Adrian, welcome to the program. Glad Thank to have you. you here. Glad to be here and glad to be here to talk about landscape astrophotography or nightscapes as I like to call it. Great. Can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a member of a few astronomy clubs. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the Warren Astronomical Society, the University Lowbrow Astronomers, and I recently started doing the Explorer Scientific Global Star Party, which is every Tuesday, usually starting around 7 Eastern, with the likes of David Levy, David Eicher from um, Astronomy, Magazine. Astronomy Magazine, yeah, and a few other, both professional and amateur um, astronomers, astrophotographers, some from the Southern Hemisphere. It's great. It's a... Uh, it's been a wonderful time and it's been an opportunity to showcase some of my uh, photography. So I'm happy. Yeah. With that. Yeah, for sure. Now, what got you into doing landscape astrophotography? There was a picture that Dr. David Levy showed me and it was a simple picture of the Southern Cross. It, I, when I saw that something, it was a live presentation. He came to the University of Michigan to um, talk to us and he showed that picture. Something about seeing the starlight on that picture inspired me to say, well, okay, you can take a camera and you can do that. And that was the very first moment I got the idea. I want to take pictures of the stars of the night and I want to, um, I want to see how far I can go with that. So it, it was very intriguing. That's where it took off. Okay. All right. Um, what are some of the techniques then that, that you use to uh, to do this type of photography. Happy to. There's different techniques that you can use. Um, so for starters, I'll take a camera, a tripod, a wide-angle lens, a remote shutter, and a clear night. Sometimes a cloudy night. Cloudy um, night. Yeah. Um, a good example is Port Austin. Um, I decided to go out there. It's raining and we're looking over Lake Huron. I can barely see anything with my eyes. And um, Port, I think it's Port Sanilac there I was at. And um, I decided to just take a long exposure. And um, when I took the long exposure, I still ended up getting something that had broken through. Okay. Um, when I go to places that are dark, like Port Austin, for instance, the, um, the image here shows the zodiacal light. And um, I didn't expect to get that when I was there. I, um, I was just there aiming north, or in this case, I'm aiming, I'm aiming uh, northwest, and just aiming at the Milky Way, seeing what I could get. And that was the very first time that I caught zodiacal light. With that, the technique I used was a simple 20-second exposure, sitting on a tripod, no tracker or anything like that, and that image popped out. Wow, wow. So it was, um, I started there, and then I started, getting a, I started getting trackers to use to be able to follow the Earth's rotation, sure. follow the night sky. So now I can take images for 30 seconds, or if I wanted to take deeper images, I could take um, you know, deeper Milky Way images. I could go for 30 seconds or longer. Um, without in, getting streaky stars. Without getting streaky stars. For sure. instance, in the Upper Peninsula, which is at one point was one of the darkest sites that I had been to. And I looked up and I saw naked eye, the shape and color of the Milky Way, inspiring, inspiring to me. Sure. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. And um, you can see by the image, this is what it looked like after a minute of exposure, middle of nowhere, um, just going somewhere where it's dark and aiming the camera at it and seeing what I could get. Um, using a tracker, it followed the rotation, so for a minute's time, 
I ended up getting the uh, that Milky Way shot that you see. That's, that's a fantastic shot. You really get a lot of the uh, the dark dust lanes. Yes. Really stand out in that image. And even more fantastic than that was um, the fact that you could see those dust lanes naked eye. Not quite as good as a Bortle One site, and we'll get maybe get into that later. But okay. Um, okay. at a darker site, the brightness of the Milky Way is your guide to how um, dark a site it is. Yeah, at a certain point, you see the same kind of stars, but the Milky Way goes from being just kind of a wisp, a wispy cloud-looking thing to having shape and structure like you're seeing yeah, there. That's, and, that's um, fantastic. That's yeah, fantastic. It, and that, that had me continue on. Now, we were talking about types. There are those that'll take, um, they'll be at a less darker site, but they'll take frames over and over, over, and over again. Okay. Kind of like classic astrophotography, which we'll also discuss a little bit later. Um, they'll take a bunch of frames over and over again. Then they'll take a frame of the foreground. And then they'll stack things. They'll put it together at the end, and then they'll end up with an image. Okay. The style that I like to do is a single shot. I go there, I compose my shot, much like a regular photographer. Sure. Compose the shot, and coming from an amateur astronomer background, you don't need to use things like photo pills or anything. You use sky safari, and you know when something's going to rise, and you capture it, and if you're in front of seeing like a big lake or, or maybe even just a house, you, um, you know, you take that sort of shot. And for instance, this is, a, I'm in front of this big lake, the moon pops up and so does a slight halo while I'm taking the image. If you were able to see what I could see before I took that image, there, it, it was dark, there was nothing there. So about how long of an exposure was this? That recall? was about a 30 second exposure. Okay. And for those of you that are out there that know camera jargon, ISO, um, you shoot a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, the ISO is up to 6400 and the uh, shutter speed 30 seconds and I use wide aperture lenses. So okay. the um, f-stop 2.8. Okay. Um, I've, I've used even wider than that in the past, so, well, so it, yeah. Even here, I mean, it's just the foreground tree, you've got across the lake, and of course, even farther is the Milky Way. And another, yep, Milky Way photography, but another thing that meteors um, will show up, the darker the skies. This happens to be in Alcona, um, at the Alcona campground, and the Perseids were going on, and we were, um, Watching the Perseids, I was there with uh, Dr. Brian Ottom, who you may oh, be yes. familiar I've, with. Oh, yes, I've met him at a Stratum yeah. Beach. Yeah, sure. he's, he does really good landscape and, you know, even I've seen some of his work at, at the event. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's beautiful work. And one of the places that we like to go also is Lake Hudson. But as you can see in this photo, well, sometimes it's cloudy. This was the one thing that led me also led me into landscape astrophotography. With other forms of astronomy, when the clouds come, you're done. Right. And I decided, well, I don't want to be done. I want to keep shooting. I want to see if I can do something. This picture is a perfect example of, well, it's cloudy, but as long as there's a little bit of starlight, I might still get something interesting. And hey, may as well make it black and white while we're at it. So there is a bit of artsiness to it that you don't see in you know, your classic astrophotography. You, you know, you're focused on a topic and what you see is what you get. Sure. There are folks that'll do some things to try and make it a little more artsy. I like to capture what I'm seeing. I like to take the viewer to whatever spot I am you know, and have them notice what's... Um, what's out there and this is a very interesting shot you've got it looks like the sun is setting or is that rising so the sun is actually an hour away from rising that's the moon oh, really? and this is what's known as a daybreak um 
Milky Way, where if it's dark enough and the first vestiges of astronomical twilight start, your image ends up with this blue image. Um, I have another image like that at Taquamanan Falls. If you remember the Milky Way shot that I took, beautiful, bright Milky Way. Mm -hmm. I was headed to Taquamanan Falls to take a very similar shot. When I got there, set up the camera, the light changed in an instant. And it was, actually, it was too bright. The image that you see, if you look carefully to the right, go above the part of the falls and the tree, you'll see the last vestiges of the Milky Way as it's disappearing in the astronomical twilight. You can see it right at the, the top of the image there. Yes. You can still pick up some stars. You can barely pick it up. And so I missed that opportunity. I'm hoping to go again. Okay. Um, but that's, and that's why I missed it, because of that photo ah, okay. that I took. It was, I was out on a highway, and at the time, it was the best view of the Milky Way that I've seen, that's, that's, that I had seen. That's fantastic. This has been a great conversation. We're going to have to take a quick break mm -hmm. right here. Um, if you have any questions, please send us an email. Uh, the address is there for you at the bottom of your screen. And uh, coming up next is Term of the Month with Stephen. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is cats. I heard from David Levy that cats are like comets. They both have tails and do whatever they want. That said, there's also now an, an astronomical acronym for a cat. That's Comet Asteroid Transition Object. An object starts out as a comet, and as the volatiles disappear, is left looking like an asteroid. The usual term is extinct comet. The nucleus of comets are often rich in organic compounds. Comets that cross the Earth's path may cause annual meteor showers. There are comets that appear to be running out of volatiles with which to create the coma and the tails. These may be in transition, and time will tell. Asteroid 3200 Phaethon has an orbit that matches the Geminid meteor shower. So it's an asteroid, but it had to have been a comet, we think. 6558 Echelkus Ech <laughs> has displayed a cometary coma, so it is also called 174P Echelkus. There are other once a comet candidates. In 2010, the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission visited 162-173 Ryugu and has since returned samples. In recent news, there is speculation that Ryugu may be a cat. That's because Ryugu is a rubble pile asteroid rather than being a, a big single boulder. And Ryugu is shaped like a spinning top, probably from fast rotation. And also, Ryugu is high in organic matter, like a comet nucleus. So rather than being formed by a collision of last, larger asteroids, it seems likely that it is instead the remains of a comet that has lost volatile materials. And that's the term of the month, cats. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back. We're talking with our guest, Adrian Bradley, about landscape astrophotography. Now, Adrian, what's the difference between a photographer and an amateur astronomer. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the composition of the images and the detail shown to the night sky to me is a part of the difference. As an amateur astronomer, we tend to know what's going on in the night sky. So when I frame it, um, we, we frame it to show what's out there, whereas a photographer might just be looking for a beautiful picture and you know having the two sort of blend together to create this image. Um, take for example a picture of a sunset that a you know a landscape photographer would take. Um, this is an image that I took. It's a beautiful sunset. Most of the time with a photographer we would just be looking to compose the sunset, shoot it, and then get out of there before it gets dark. Part of my fascination with sunsets as an amateur astronomer is that I'm looking at that as a star. 
and I'm my interest in the sunset comes from a background in um, astronomy and you know to me that's still an astrophoto even though it's it's the one astrophoto you can take in the daytime there you go so yep did that's you use any filters or is this just a straight through this is a straight through shot okay. it was um it was taken with the aperture as um narrow as i could get it okay. and when the sun's low in the horizon like that it's a little safer to shoot at it without burning up any gear sure, sure. i tried shooting at the sun with no filter I aimed at it and I immediately pulled the camera away because I said, this is not a good idea. No, no. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, the Astronomical League tells you, uh, please do not look at the sun without the aid of you know, special equipment. Sure. Without approved eye eyewear to um, stare at the sun safely or an approved telescope or filter on the telescope to look at the sun safely. Exactly. So if none of us learn anything from this TV show, do not stare at the sun unless exactly. you know what you're doing. Exactly, exactly. So uh, anything else you can tell us about uh, the difference on those, those two or? Uh... Well, a lot of photographers will use tools to look for um, certain things in the sky like, okay, the core of the Milky Way is going to rise at this time, the photo pills, for instance. It'll tell them, and that'll let them know, okay, well, I better get up. An amateur astronomer is going to know, okay, the core of the Milky Way is rising. Sagittarius is below that. Scorpion is below that. And if you look in the image, we can rattle off so many things in this um, Milky Way shot. Rho Fiuki, the Sagittarius star cloud, M5, M20. We can rattle off um, the Swan Nebula, the Eagle Nebula. You can go, there's other NGC objects that are there. There's uh, the coat hangers further along in the Cygnus region. There's actually the core of the Milky Way, and then there's the Cygnus region. Um, and I think actually this is a, if you, if you look at that image, it's a good time to talk about what's considered Milky Way season where a lot of photographers, it kind of goes into the difference. Photographers will wait for that part of the Milky Way to be rising to take Milky Way shots. Whereas amateur astronomers who like taking wide angle know that the Milky Way is up year round. And sure. we'll shoot at other parts of the Milky Way. And the darker the skies, the more impressive it is. And um, that leads us into you know, classic astrophotography as well versus uh, landscape astrophotography. Photographers will take a straight shot, fiddle with settings, make sure it's good, and they'll go. A classic astrophotographer such as Steve, Sean, my fault, Sean, our cameraman, who took this beautiful shot of the Rosette Nebula, which is 130 light years across and 5,000 light years away from us. Classic astrophotography focuses on an object in space, a deep sky object. Whereas the landscape astrophotography, the wide field focuses on a much bigger section of the sky. Like we see here. Yes, like we see here. So you're seeing this section of the Milky Way. And if you remember that Rosette Nebula, that's maybe half a degree just off the horizon below the bigger red spot, which is Lambda Orionis near okay. the bottom of the screen. So you've got the ground, you've got Lambda Orionis, that's Orion. And then if you go down below that red spot and a little to the left, you'll see that dot, that's that same Rosette Nebula. Yeah, I can barely make it out Sean, on our monitor here. Yeah, that Sean took that image of. That 130 light years across and 5,000 light years away from us becomes a speck. So yeah. there's, a, there's a certain perspective that I really love um, showing with an image like that. I noticed too that this is a, a desert shot. Yes. Where was this taken? This was during the Okie Tech Star Party in Kenton, Oklahoma. Okay. Um, every fall on, on the new moon or you know, at least the moon's a crescent, um, they, they started up those, uh, I think they had one year, the COVID year, yeah. where they didn't oh, yeah. have it and then they started doing those star parties again. Okay. Uh, 
four to one skies, some of the darkest skies in America that you can go to. And um, when I went there, that was the one time that the Bortle two um, skies of the UP, those skies dwarfed it in comparison. I have talked with people who have gone to the Texas Star Party, which is a little bit farther south near the Davis Mountains. Yes. And they have told me that the light from the Milky Way will cast a shadow. It casts a shadow there as well. It doesn't quite cast a shadow um, in the Upper Peninsula, Okay. but it starts. Um, quick little story. When you're watching the Milky Way appear in a uh, dark sky, the sun isn't down yet and you start seeing detail like you're seeing in this picture, it starts to show up, you know, as if it's, it's just a part of, it's the part of the sky. Yeah. And it gets brighter and brighter as the sun goes down. And the detail that you're seeing here, to some extent, you're seeing that same detail, naked eye, as it's appearing in the border one skies. It's, it, what you can see naked eye here, where I took this picture, um, you know, what, I, what you can see there, it's barely the structure. You can barely see the color that's in there. But when you go to a Border One site, like at the Okie Tech Star Party, you'll see a lot more detail. You'll even see some of the nebula that's there and that star cloud. You'll also see more of the other parts of the Milky Way, which when we talk about Milky Way season, most photographers would tend to think Milky Way season is when the core is rising up in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Milky Way season is year round. The darker your skies, the more that you see that. You've got the Cygnus region, you've got the Cassiopeia region, and what we're seeing in the image right now is a region that's near Orion that is not as photographed. Most of the time you'll see, if you photograph Orion, the astrophotographers, some landscape astrophotographers will focus on Orion and make sure that it's, you see all of the nebulosity around Orion. There are dust lanes and there's a ton of nebulosity that's in that part of the Milky Way. More so than just M42. More so than M42, more yeah. so than the Witch Head, more so than Lambda Orionis. Okay. Now, the, when you look at this part of the Milky Way, it's the core. And of course, the Southern Hemisphere, during our summer and their winter, the core rises directly overhead. So they see a lot more Milky Way. So when you talk Milky Way season, you gotta talk Southern Hemisphere see something different as well. Okay. And here's another part of the Milky Way over uh, the Osable River in Alcona. And I'm facing north, so a bit of aurora. I ended up catching a bit of aurora. That's the Cygnus region of the Milky Way. Just as beautiful, but it's cold. It, I yes. think I shot this at six degrees Fahrenheit. That's and, cold. Um, that's cold. Yes. And, um, of, for a lot of photographers, the dedication to come out and shoot a Milky Way in that cold and frame a winter picture, mm -hmm. a lot of it they may learn to do so after talking to an amateur astronomer about the different things, you know, the different parts of the Milky Way. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I like to do a single shot. That's a 30, that's a uh, 30 second exposure with the ISO turned up with the, uh, a modified camera that pulls in more of the HA light. And I like, to, I like to shoot those because then I can take those shots. If it is real cold, I can get out of there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if there's animal sounds going on or other sounds, I can get out of there. <laughs> I leave with my shot intact and, and I'm happy about it. And where but, you uh, go. In, in looking at that image, I noticed a galaxy to the upper left. That would be M31, the Andromeda. And, that was Andromeda, okay, yeah. And if we look, I think I just miss it to the right. M33, the light of M33 shows up as well, but it's harder to tell in that photo. So okay, I just I wanted to comment on that because I looked at that and I was yep. thinking it might be Andromeda, but I thought, it is. I'll let you tell me. Yeah, so, so those, those are the differences. You can get beautiful shots if you stack your images so that you get the bright Milky Way, I prefer to take them the single shot 
because it makes the shots more accurate and I find they're more appealing to astronomy folks and that's where I'm content. I don't necessarily have to have a beautiful, you know, fantastic picture that looks kind of cartoonish. I want my pictures to be accurate and beautiful at the same time. And that's where Adrian lives. That's right where there. I live. Absolutely. Exactly. I want to thank you all for joining us uh, for this program. Uh, Adrian, again, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to join us and uh, to talk about your work. Uh, please uh, check out the website. The address is down at the bottom of your screen. And coming up to finish off the show, as always, is Stephen with What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for April 2020? Here in the Northern Hemisphere, the days are getting longer, but since we have passed the equinox, they're getting longer, uh, slower. So south of the equator, it's, you know, shorter and slower. Now, everyone knows that the moon is about 4.56 billion years old, but on the 1st and on the 30th, we're going to call it new. The first quarter is on the 9th, the full moon is on the 16th, the, um, on, uh, on just seven days after that, the moon is in abject poverty, it's down to its last quarter on the 23rd. Then we have Jupiter, Venus, Neptune, Mars, Saturn, Vesta, and Pluto. Now, Jupiter is, goes from Aquarius to Pisces and rises one to two hours before sunrise. It's best at the end of the month. In fact, most of these uh, in the morning are best at the end of the month. But the exception is Venus goes from Capricornus to Pisces and uh, uh, rises very similar to Jupiter, but is best at the beginning of the month because, you know, Venus moves so fast. Neptune goes from Aquarius to Aquarius. It's been in Aquarius for years. It rises one to two hours before sunrise and is best at end of the month. Mars goes from Capricornus to Aquarius, rises two to three hours before sunrise, best at the end of the month. Saturn goes from, uh, is in Capricornus and rises two to three hours before sunrise, best at the end of the month. If you have a big enough telescope to see Pluto, it's in Sagittarius, it rises three to four hours before sunrise, and it's best at the end of the month, but Three hours before sunrise for Pluto is not bad. The, the skies are already pretty dark, uh, so get a, an excellent finer chart and um, dress warm and all of that other stuff. Mercury is shown here at the end of the month. It goes from Pisces to Taurus. Um, it has superior conjunction on April 2nd, so it's directly behind the sun. You're not going to see it really at the beginning of the month at all, but it is an astounding 20 and a half degrees away from the sun at the end of the month. So it's shown here uh, at the end of the month, um, just after sunset. Uranus is shown at the beginning of the month uh, because, and it's shown in the morning, uh, I'm sorry, it's shown in the evening. Uranus is in Aries all month, it sets two to zero hours after sunset, so it's best at the beginning of the month. We're losing Uranus pretty soon. And that's what's up in the night sky for April 2020. Remember, we don't charge for this show, but we may tax your brain. <laughs>